Hi everyone, I'm Michael Short. This is Let's Go Outdoors. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go outdoors, me and you. Let's Go Outdoors with Michael Short. Supported by the Alberta Conservation Association. Hi everyone, welcome to Let's Go Outdoors. I'm Michael Short. Coming up, we take a backcountry ski trip to the Tonquin Valley located near Jasper. <laughs> Alma picks up a paddle and heads out to visit Alberta's only canoe circuit located at Lakeland Provincial Park. Let's just take a walk down and we can have a look at your shoreline. Speaking of water, we take a closer look at a program designed to help folks who live around our lakes on how to be good stewards of our freshwater resources. There is little doubt Alberta is developing a reputation as a leader when it comes to understanding avalanche conditions. We had an opportunity to head out with one of the public safety officers with Alberta Parks as he monitors the snowpack. So just how are avalanche conditions tested? Well, we're going to join Jeremy McKenzie, a public safety specialist with Alberta Parks in Kananaskis country, as he visits one of the many test sites used in the area to determine the avalanche hazard. Once a suitable area has been found, it's time to start digging. Now that a sizable area has been cleared, Jeremy can start to analyze the snow structure. Well, I've got an avalanche probe here and uh, mine has numbers on it. So I'm just checking the, the depth of the snow and I'm going to start with a, a snow profile today. We uh, do testing of the snowpack and the layering throughout the winter and as part of our forecasting program. And so some of the things that we're looking at is things like the density of the snow, the temperature, the crystal sizes and shapes, and that just helps us evaluate the type of avalanche hazard we have on any given day. Sort of the first part is I just sort of feel down and mark where the, some of the particular layers of concern are. So I, you can see visually there's some differences in layers and I'm just sliding my crystal screen and I'll do the same thing with my finger down here, just feeling for changes in density and any obvious layers. So there's one right here, it's quite obvious that we're, uh, we've been tracking all winter long. So by digging into the snow and looking at the various layers and through some additional tests, Jeremy is able to get a pretty good indication of the history of the snowpack and its potential avalanche risk. So at the very basic level, this is something that would happen if we had an avalanche initiate. We've got a, a stiffer layer sitting on, in this case, a very thin but very weak layer, and that's all it takes. And we really like to have a look at these fractures because that came off very, very clean and very, very smooth, indicating that there's more possibility for an avalanche to initiate. It's those ice crystals that play an important role in understanding avalanche conditions. You have a couple of different types of crystals in general terms. Some of them actually bond quite well together and they sort of get stuck together and those would be stronger layers. Then you get crystals because of things like temperature and humidity that don't bond well together and they become kind of a loose sort of a sugary type snow. This one in particular that's causing us some problems this winter is actually a V-shaped crystal and it get, when it gets buried it can only hold so much load before it fractures. Some mountain locations are even more breathtaking in winter than they are in summer. Tonquin Valley is one of those places. This spectacular winter wonderland is located about a half hour's drive southwest of Jasper. The trailhead is not that far from Marmot Ski Basin. While thousands go skiing each winter at Marmot, only a few hundred or so ski into Tonquin. But as our cameraman Bobby Jones discovered, those who do so are richly rewarded. The journey doesn't start off that exciting. 
a 12 kilometer trudge up an unplowed road. I'm amazed to see a pair of families making the hump in. How did these dads ever manage to keep a pair of five-year-old boys and seven-year-old girls motivated to keep going? Chocolate, stories. We're, we're starting to scrape the bottom of the barrel. We're <laughs> yeah, getting into- It's uh, getting pretty ugly near yeah, the top there, but yeah, we, yeah, yeah, yeah. But a lot of potty humor yeah. was the last kilometer. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, they arrive at the Edith Cabell Hostel. How far did you guys go? Almost 13 kilometers. Are you tired? Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> what do seven-year-olds talk about for eight hours? <laughs> we talked about gymnastics. <laughs> yeah, and him turtles, and dressmaking parties for our Maple Leaf girls. And we always talked about, of course, hamsters! Well, I gotta confess, you won't see our group jumping around in the snow after a long day of skiing. Meet our gang, six men, all in their 50s. Day two of our trek calls for a 27 kilometer ski into a private lodge where our meals will be provided. Other than one long hill, the terrain is relatively easy and the views just keep getting better and better. After about seven hours of skiing, this will be the prize. The magnificent Tonquin Valley and the majestic ramparts, part of the Rocky Mountain Great Divide. It's just pristine, it's clear, you can see animal tracks, it's just, you can't get this in a city, you have to come out in the back country to get it. Like you could even look back there at those mountains and you could just imagine that no one's ever been here. I don't think there's any range of mountains more spectacular in the world. At the lodge, Gloria is busy baking cinnamon buns for our arrival. 20 years of cooking in here and I still have to read a recipe. 20 years ago, Gloria's son bought this place and she came for one winter to help him out. She's still here. Guests at the Tonquin Valley Lodge are treated to the finest of meals. I can't show you our arrival at the lodge. It was dark by the time we arrived, but Gloria was there to greet us with a big smile and a large plate of steaming cinnamon buns. And we all made it, some looking more exhausted than others though. Survival is the name of the game. Come here for survival and the scenery. I made the mistake of actually renting new gear, something I wanted to try, but perhaps uh, shouldn't be trying on such an arduous trip. But uh, the beauty about that is, uh, though I was absolutely wasted, I mean, uh, nobody left me behind. <laughs> so. Day three, we wake up to a <laughs> gorgeous sunny day. There are wood stoves in all the cabins, a welcome comfort, in winter, there are two other places to stay in the Tonquin Valley. Tonquin Adventures is another private lodge, and the Waits Gibson Hut is run by the Alpine Club of Canada. This is our easy day. Some are still a little sore from yesterday, so we just go for a leisurely ski. We got bull-legged bulls, buddy. <laughs> Tuck them in, tuck them in. Stick to this side of the camera. <laughs> Half an hour ago, I skied up a little hill over here somewhere. It was dead quiet. I skied ahead of my friends and there was nothing. It was, it was, there wasn't even wind. It was a total absence of sound. And that was pretty cool because I would say in today's world, we don't get that very often. Day four, another beautiful morning. It's crisp. Temperatures are in the low minus 20s. We're all heading towards McCarab Pass, a shorter way out than how we came in, about 23 kilometers. It won't take long to warm up. It's a long, steady uphill climb to the top of the pass. You can find yourself in places like this. They're, they're magnificent and the rewards are there whether you're 40 or 60. It gives you a lot of energy, I think, places like this. It's totally doable. It's hard, it's challenging, yes, but it's not impossible. And I definitely encourage other people my age to come do it one of the most beautiful valleys around and it's one of the unique uh, areas that allow you a loop where you can have accommodation along the way it's a good place it's certainly not for beginners but for intermediate and expert skiers the Tonquin Valley is an adventure that's not to be missed hope to see you out on the trail 
Here's something you should know. Each winter, Parks Canada closes the Tonquin Valley until February 15th. The area is home to a threatened woodland caribou herd. The lodge uses snowmobiles to bring in supplies, and those packed snowmobile trails would give wolves access to those caribou. By mid-February, the caribou have moved out of the Tonquin. Coming up, Alma paddles her way through the waters of Lakeland Provincial Park. Tiring. <laughs> the Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Fish and Game Association, Alberta Hunter Education Instructors Association, Alberta Professional Outfitters Society, Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. When it comes to understanding the impact the oil and gas sector has on our environment, there is no shortage of opinion. That's one of the reasons teachers at a junior high school in Grand Prairie see the value in taking their students on a field trip so they can form their own views of the oil and gas sector. We're really happy to have you guys here and we're going to host you on this tour here through the Centre of Research and Innovation. These students from Derek Taylor School in Grand Prairie are getting a first-hand look at how the oil and gas industry benefits in using the Evergreen Centre for resource excellence and innovation as its outdoor classroom. And the Oil Sands Group now, which now is, is formed into Canadian Oil Sands Innovation Alliance, they are now planting upwards of 500,000 trees as a result of this project in Grand Prairie here. Our community and all of us are gonna be involved in helping the oil sands reduce their environmental footprint. Students also get the opportunity to interact with some of the displays, which goes a long way to developing a better understanding of how the industry works. Education has come a long way as to where we may have experience sitting in a classroom, still in university, sitting through a four-hour lecture and having the students come out to a facility that, first of all, they have access to in the future and they have that personal connection to have an impact and take a look at the process of preventing any damage is great. I think they see it in our community and now they can make that connection regarding leases that are being built, um, signage in the community, what does it mean, sour gas wells, for example, that safety concern, they do have that connection. This is called a geogrid reinforced oil structure. From wind power, river and stream crossings to more topical industry issues. So with proper maintenance, a pipeline should last forever. Dude, this is called a geoweb road. And you guys are actually gonna build this here today. The innovation also expands to new roadways, which this student seems to be impressed with. We got told we were gonna do a hands-on project, but I didn't think it would be this big. I like the innovation of it, and I, I guess I like doing it too, though. Michael, I hear Alma has decided to take up paddling. <laughs> yes, she's always game for a challenge, so I sent her up to Lakeland Provincial Park, just east of Lac La Biche. Road access to the park is excellent, and as Alma discovers, it's one of the best places in Alberta for a multi-day adventure by canoe. It's scenic views like this and the iconic call of the loon, along with other wildlife encounters that should put Lakeland Provincial Park on your bucket list. Access to the water can be achieved in two ways. For those with larger boats heading down the ATV trail, mile 10 is your only access point. For Mary and I, we are taking the traditional portage route, which is made a lot easier with these carts. As it turns out, I made a good choice in starting my paddling adventure on a lake like this. Well, Lakeland Provincial Park is a good place to start your canoeing career. Uh, we have five interconnected lakes, connected by portages and a little bit of a walk to get started. Part of the journey is meeting folks who have already spent time on the lake and can provide you with information, <laughs> or in this case, an amusing story. The squirrel in camp was a problem. Oh, really? Vicious, tenacious, <laughs> uh, lots of initiative, and uh, not afraid of people. So he was into everything. 
Well, that was a good break. But now it's time to get these canoes down to the water. We may have gotten sweaty, but we got here. Now we're on the water. As this is my first attempt at paddling, Mary is quick to offer some helpful hints. If you want to um, grip your paddle at the top with that hand mm -hmm. and down by the neck with this hand, mm -hmm. okay? Mm -hmm. So push off a little bit and we're going to try and get through this grass. Before I knew it, we had arrived at the islands, and it was time to set up camp. Now this would be enough room for two tents, you think? Yeah. You just have to make sure you don't have any big sticks under your butt. Now fortunately, I have taken the How to Camp for New Canadians program that is offered by Alberta Parks, so I think I can remember how to set up my tent. <laughs> oh, this is embarrassing take some stakes and tack it down so it doesn't keep moving around. Yeah. It was then time to explore the island with Mary. This is a very beautiful trail, Mary. Are there are lots like this around here. There's lots of trails in the park and in the adjacent recreation area. They, uh, they're multi-use for the most part. They're for hiking and mountain biking, and some of them are even um, available for ATVs. Wow, Mary, this is a beautiful lake. Yeah, and the view changes every time you go around the corner. <laughs> the reason Lakeland is so good is uh, canoe circuits are really popular with all paddlers of all levels. This is a, a nice place to come in. You get away from the busy campsites and you can explore a lot of territory and you don't have to backtrack and you don't have to worry about shuttling your vehicles. So canoe circuits are quite popular with paddlers who want to just get into the back country and relax and enjoy the peace and quiet. Ah, now that's the kind of thing I want to listen to. You know, I'd really like to go, providing I don't get attacked by a killer squirrel. Well, don't worry, we'll have that big paddle for you to protect yourself, Mary. Coming up, we will visit the first tailings pond to go through a transformation in the oil sands and is now supporting plants and wildlife. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Alberta Trappers Association. Nature Alberta. Wild Sheep Foundation Alberta. Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. Back in 2010, Suncor became the first oil sands company to take a tailings pond and return it to a natural state. The 225 hectare site is located about an hour's drive northeast of Fort McMurray. It's now been three years since the transformation. We revisit the project and hear from a team member on how things are progressing. One of the reasons I got so interested in tailings is I call it man-made geology. We're trying to recreate some of the formations that were there prior to us going in and, and extracting the, the ore. And Suncor made it even more interesting for us by constructing our offices on the shore of the pond, back when it was actually a shore. So every morning I'd go up the stairs, I'd go into my office, I'd pour myself a cup of coffee and stare out the window at the tailings pond. And it was a wonderful motivation to, to look at that and say, okay, our job is to turn this into hills, and small streams and a wetland. And uh, it, was, it was fantastic. It, it really is one of those projects that come along 
sort of once in a lifetime, once in a career, that you get to work on something like this. And I was, I was really honored to be able to, to uh, work on that team and, and achieve what we did. Being the first tailings pond in the industry closed, nobody knew what to expect. Nobody knew how it was going to react, um, how the plants were going to react, what was going to happen to the waters. So it really is a giant uh, science experiment. We've got monitoring all through there. We know where water is moving. We know how big the plants are growing. We know what areas the plants may need a little bit of help and what areas they're thriving. We see areas where there are species of plants just moving in on their own from the natural environment. Uh, we have an extensive monitoring program on the wetlands, so we know what's nesting in the wetlands, we know what, what animals are living on and near it. Uh, we monitor the, the aquatic plants very closely, so we're engaged with consultants, with uh, university researchers, with a, a huge team of people that will likely be pouring over this facility for decades to come. There's a lot to learn here, and uh, that, that's really how we're treating it. As technology improves, it could very well be that tailings ponds become a thing of the past in the oil sands. Well, Brad Fenton is into setting us straight on lacing up those boots. Hi, I'm Brad Fenson with the Alberta Fish and Game Association and your outdoor tip of the week. You know, sometimes the simplest tips are the ones we use the most. For me, there's nothing more annoying than boot laces that come undone. I mean, you want to hold them on tight so that they keep the warmth in and you get maximum traction out of your boots. The old laces that we used to have available made out of cotton were great. They'd cinch up and hold tight, but of course they'd rot and break really easy too. The new synthetic laces are very durable, but you can see that they just, they're so slippery that they won't even hold in the eyelets of the boot. Really simple to fix when you're doing them up, cinch it up, and instead of doing a single wrap, do a double or triple wrap, and when you cinch it down, it actually holds it in place so your boot won't come undone. And then you just finish it off with your bows and a double just to lock it and your laces will not come undone whether you're out hiking or hunting or even taking the kids out to the rink for some skating. This is a great way to make sure that the laces stay done up. Coming up, we take a trip out to Sylvan Lake to see how an innovative program launched by Nature Alberta is helping cottage owners be better stewards of the environment. The Alberta Conservation Association is proud to be partnered with Pheasants Forever Alberta Council, Treaty 8 First Nations of Alberta, Trout Unlimited Canada, Time now for a look at our outdoor community calendar. Owning a cottage or even living full time along the shores of one of our lakes can be a very rewarding experience. Mm -hmm. However, some lakeside residents are unknowingly contaminating the water. So Nature Alberta has developed a Living by Water program to educate cottage owners. Let's go to Pigeon Lake, southeast of Edmonton, to learn which everyday household items can pollute a lake. With more than 400 consultations across 20 lakes, shoreline advisors like Ellen have been keeping very busy. On this day, she's visiting a cottage along the shore of Pigeon Lake, owned by Peter Pellet, who agreed to see what impact his summer home may be having on the health of the lake. Hi, Peter. Hi. I'm Ellen. I'm here for your home site assessment. Great. Come on in. When we were first here, everybody took it for, for granted. Uh, we just enjoyed the lake. It was great. Uh, nobody thought of uh, the things that we're really conscious about now. And we quite frankly abused the lake. With uh, a lot of the initiatives now that are national, international, we became much more conscious of the things that we should be doing properly. And uh, that's led to, among other things, uh, this program with uh, Nature Alberta. One of the major things that we do like to look at is uh, what kind of household cleaning products that you are using. 
Anything that could end up outside or in the lake is examined. For Peter, having someone like Alan walk through his cottage and explain what kind of impact his one household is having on the lake is welcomed. Everybody would like to do something positive to help the lake. But unfortunately, I don't know really what to do. We have to have somebody that is technically available or knowledgeable to, to steer us in the right direction. And once they understand it's confidential for them, it's not a tattletale type program, they're totally on board in, Sun, in Sundance Beach. We've got, I think, 36, 38 people already in the last three weeks that have said, yes, do an assessment for me this summer and give me the report. I'd like to learn how to do things better. Are you using any kind of fertilizers on your lawn? As the inspection continues, Peter did learn a few things about the products he was using. A couple of things were a surprise. Uh, the shampoo we're using is carcinogenic, apparently, so uh, I didn't know that, etc. So we'll make a change there. We should expand the fern bed at the back of the cabin where the drain spout direct our runoff water to collect more and prevent it from going to the lake. And uh, I guess on the other side, we're doing a lot of things really quite well, so I was thrilled. It's informing homeowners about making small changes that ultimately will enhance the environment around our lakes. We really try to make it as manageable as possible so people can see that it's not hard and these little changes do add up and have a really big impact on protecting the lake. So it's kind of like, listen, all you have to do is stop mowing this, this one area or all you have to do is next time you're at Safeway, grab a different cleaning product. Let's just take a walk down and we can have a look at your shoreline. Unlike the bedrock of mountain lakes, the majority of our prairie lakes are based on nutrient-rich sedimentation. Of course, the water is going to have more nutrients uh, naturally, but at the same time, the unfortunate thing is that it kind of sets us higher. So, um, you know, we add a base level of nutrients to it, and that increases us to a point where the lake has too much nutrients, just because naturally it already has nutrients. Whereas a BC lake, if you add some nutrients to it, it kind of has a longer ways to go before you're going to get it to the point of, you know, a problematic situation. This means doing all we can to help control what gets washed into the lake from our property. What happens is when there's a heavy storm, all the water rushing through the spout won't be able to be readily absorbed um, into the soil. And so there's a greater chance that it's going to run actually down towards the lake off of your property, um, picking up contaminants uh, and end up as surface runoff in the lake. The solution, at least in Peter's case, is a rather simple and inexpensive fix. We like to do uh, direct downspouts into areas of dense vegetation uh, where their root systems will be able to pick up some of that runoff and help absorb it and make sure it gets filtered through the soil. Okay. So a really easy option would be just to kind of extend this um, fern bed you have here. Or another great way uh, which helps you to conserve water as well is just installing a rain barrel. Another key area of concern is of course the shoreline itself. It's here that some property owners make the mistake of removing weed beds in order to improve swimming conditions people have this notion that anything that grows in the water is a weed and uh, that's a really kind of hurdle that we try to break down immediately because you know cattails those are all native plants and so important for holding your shoreline together and for habitat I mean how often do you see bird nests in the cattails or you know other animals using the cattails of fish especially so um, we really want to keep those reeds in place like they're critical you know they do a lot for your water quality in terms of um, filtering out nutrients and also just in terms of um, turbidity so I mean if you have a property that has been cleared and you go look at the water adjacent to the shoreline it's going to be muggy because you know this dirt from the shoreline is just eroding into the water whereas if you have a property with cattails you know they're going to hold a lot of that sediment in and then you know the the surrounding area will be clearer give nature alberta a call if you would like to have a confidential environmental assessment done on your lakeside home well, here's hoping more cottage owners uh, take up this program mary yeah it's great that it's free and confidential if you would like to catch previous stories featured on Let's Go Outdoors, then track down our website at letsgooutdoors.ca. Remember, the outdoors is here for all of us to enjoy. If you see someone taking away from that enjoyment, call the report a poacher line. Till next time, I'm Mary Hulbert. And I'm Michael Short. Let's go outdoors. I know where I want to be. Outside wild and free. Let's go out. Let's go outdoors, you and me. Let's go outdoors where the waters run clear and cold. Mother Nature's world is better than gold. So much to see, so much to do. Let's go out.